At this time, I'd like to call the meeting of the Dysart Unified School District Governing Board to order. Let the record reflect that all members are present. And we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And we'll, uh, next up was uh, recognitions and celebrations. Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board and members of cabinet. This evening we are very happy to be celebrating some extraordinary accomplishments of our students and the hard work that they and their coaches have put in over the last year. Mr. Dean will introduce this item. Good evening, Madam President, members of the governing board, Dr. Kellis, and members of cabinet. Just as we did at the last governing board meeting, had the opportunity to recognize several state champions, we have the opportunity again this evening tonight. And tonight we focus on our arts area and we're very excited this evening to let the governing board know that the indoor percussion group Convergence, um, which is based out of Willow Canyon but features students from all throughout the district, is the state champion as well as our winter guard. Congratulations, please come, come forward and please be recognized. If you could just stay right up here at the front, if you could just gather right up here at the front, that'd be great. Just hang out right here. You can use the steps. Just hang out right here for a second. How's it going? Good. good. You guys having a good So ladies and gentlemen in the audience, governing board members, before um, we dismiss this group, we would just like to thank Coach Rad and, and all of the other coaches for all the time and effort that they put into um, what they do. This group is phenomenal. If you've never had an opportunity to see Willow Canyon's Winter Guard and the Convergence per Percussion Group, you are missing out because they are absolutely phenomenally amazing and they highlight and spotlight how great the arts programs in our school district absolutely are. Would you in the audience please once again congratulate our state champions. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks guys. Next up, we have um, audience with individuals. Do we have any speakers? Madam President, we have several asking to speak tonight. I, I do have um, multiple requests um, that are specific to uh, 
a particular agenda item, H3. So those I will wait to call up until we get to that agenda item, although we do have one individual who would like to speak, um, but I'll go ahead and read the uh, statement. This is the time for the public to comment. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Pursuant to ARS 38-431.01H, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism, or scheduling the matter for future consideration and decision at a later date. In order to facilitate accomplishing the, the business of the district in a timely manner, a time limit of three minutes will be imposed for each individual or group addressing the board. When you approach the podium, please state your name for the record. And we will start with Mr. Joseph Benton. Uh, good evening, board members and extraordinary members of Dysart Unified School District. My name's Joseph Benton. This is my seventh year as a social studies teacher at Shadow Ridge High School, where I am also the current history department chair. My comments tonight directly reference the previous meetings uh, addressing the adoption of the World History Project pilot. Uh, one concern I have is that the board has forgotten the democratic process when they voted against adopting the curriculum as a piloted program skipping public comment and usurping curriculum committees. The comments made by the board members were deeply troubling to not my, only myself, but also my many other colleagues throughout all curriculums. It is clear that the board did not fully vet the curriculum, but merely saw bullets and key phrases that they believed controversial. This resulted in the board illustrating possible misunderstanding of what social studies is as a subject, as well as critical state standards. Worse, it appears as if the board was showing personal political bias against standard topics that have been approved by the Arizona Board of Education. History is not merely facts or, quote, written by the winners. It's actually written by people, people who are fallible, people who make mistakes or write based off their own experience without foresight of the present. Creating controversy in history and discovering new information is history, and history changes all the time. What the board inexcusably declared as, quote, a dangerous path was the belief that students should not be taught, quote, accounts based on particular perspectives, or to, quote, pick the stories apart, analyze, test the claim, and build their own lenses. What you are effectively saying is that the danger facing our students in Dysart is the ability to receive an education in which multiple perspectives are given, diversity is celebrated, recognizing bias, and then addressing it. I must remind you that even though these young adults are impressionable, the worst thing we can do as educators is only let them think one perspective. It's an accumulation of uh, one perspective. The worst thing that we can do as educators is only let them think one perspective on any subject. History teaches just this, that history is not set in stone. It is not one perspective. It is the accumulation of primary and secondary sources, otherwise known as stories and narratives mixed with raw data from varied number of different perspectives and interpretations to give us the most likely truth about the past. Therefore, history is not just facts. Members of the board, please understand that we live in a highly technological and globalized world, and like it or not, students need to be prepared to be members of it. In fact, it is part of our state and national standards and part of our Shadow Ridge mission statement of home, in which E stands for empowerment, through collaboration, networking, students have the confidence to explore real world issues that will prepare them for contributing members in our global society. I encourage the board members to please reconsider their decision about adopting the World History Project curriculum and to please do whatever it takes to serve our students over their own political agendas and talking points. Thank you. The rest of the comments will be held for the agenda item. Next, we have the student update, Dr. Killis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board and members of cabinet. We do have a student update. Thank you, Luis. There. My name is Luis Payan. I am a member of DLC, currently attending Valley Vista High School. Uh, currently, we are planning to send out a district-wide survey to all of our high school students, asking them one question. And that question is, why is Dysart extraordinary? After the survey, we will be presenting the board with the top 10 to 15 responses. And we also share the results online. We also want to add that Dysart, Willow, and Shadow have all had their proms, and Valley Vista will be holding theirs on May 8th. And that is all I have to report. Thank 
you. Next, we have the superintendent update, Dr. Killis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, and members of cabinet. Um, this week, we or last week, we recognized our Dysart heroes, and I want to again extend uh, congratulations to all the all those who um, received this prestigious award. We have a lot of heroes throughout the district who do extraordinary things every single day, and it was a pleasure to recognize a few of of those employees and volunteers um, at that special ceremony. We have state testing going on right now, and so I wish all of the students the best of luck, the best of success, um, and also to thank everyone, whatever role you have in the district, that helped to prepare the students for the AZM2 test. And then next week is our Teacher Appreciation Week. We are calling it our Employee Appreciation Week, and we're recognizing all our educators throughout the district. That's all I have to report. Uh, next, we have the Governing Board update, and uh, I'll start. Um, I also attended the Dysart Heroes event, and I just wanted to extend, again, another um, congratulations to all of our uh, Dysart Heroes. We really do appreciate all that you do, um, and also those that were not you know, able to be recognized. So just really appreciate all that you do. Thanks. Let's see. Excuse me. I visited Shadow Ridge High School, um, and last night I had the fun event of attending the uh, end of the year band concert and it was really enjoyable and I don't know I, people sitting around me when the jazz band started I couldn't sit still it was it was a lot of fun um, I also attended the uh, heroes uh, ceremony um, and last week was volunteer appreciation week and I know volunteers haven't been in the schools because of the COVID and everything, so I hope they're nice and rested up so that next year when school starts are gonna be very, very busy. Um, and of course, with the uh, Employee Appreciation Week next week, uh, thank you to everybody in the district for what you do for our students. So that's it. I would just like to um, take a moment to congratulate the Valley Vista Palm Line for a successful trip to UDA Nationals in Orlando, Florida last week where they competed in the National Dance Team Championship event at the ESPN Center in Disney World. The team received their bid to UDA Nationals after receiving a superior rating for their comp camp routine in July. The team, under the coaching and leadership of Ms. Amy Crow, advanced to finals, where they ultimately improved their semifinal score from the previous day. This is a very rigorous competition, one in which no other Dysart Spirit Line has ever attended, so they were, not, they were going in not knowing what to expect. But these young ladies and their coach represented our district in an extraordinary ways, and for that, they should be very proud. And I would just like to thank every, there were so many people, too many to name personally, but um, Valley Vista administration, district administration, parents, um, so many people that um, went above and beyond um, to make this happen for this team. And we are all um, greatly appreciative. So congratulations again to Valley Vista Palm. And then last, but certainly not least, I just wanna wish our teachers um, a very happy Teacher Appreciation Week for next week. It's been a challenging year, and I appreciate all of you who continued to show up every day, determined to make this year successful despite the many obstacles that we all faced, and that your dedication and commitment is just very much appreciated. So I hope you enjoy your week next week. That's all I have. Uh, I do have a couple of events that I have attended, um, but I first want to preface it by saying that um, the reason that uh, board members actually attend um, concerts or STEM celebrations or uh, go into the schools and actually see our teachers and students um, engaged is because um, we don't sit up here just to sit up here. We go in and see what is going on in the schools and we appreciate everybody's, um, uh, everything that they do for our students. And um, to actually see a concert with um, all the preparation and all the man hours it takes to perform that concert, um, all the man hours it takes for to put on a STEM um, celebration, um, we appreciate that. And all of us up here have flexible, um, sometimes very rigorous, but then sometimes flexible schedules, and we get to our schools as often as possible. So we do appreciate what our teachers and students do. And one of the things that we do um, go into the schools and see is known as a CIP, which is a continuous improvement plan. And each of these schools actually give us um, uh, benchmark data 
uh, the Dibbles testing data, uh, high school credit, um, things of that nature, and their challenges that they have put up with over the past year, what folk, things they need to focus on for the next year. So it really gives us a better um, shot uh, looking at what is going on in the school. So we really appreciate the work that our uh, teams put in to share with us about the continuous improvement plan. Um, I attended four of those uh, last week and I think one this week. And um, also uh, thank you to the admin professionals uh, on the 21st of April. Um, we know our admin is the backbone of our uh, school, uh, schools and uh, the district office, so we thank them for what they do. Uh, attended the Dysart Hero Celebration. Uh, looked a little bit different this year, but um, we were still able to congratulate our heroes and also congratulate everyone else. Uh, also attended the, um, the concert last night for Shadow Ridge and um, they played, I had no idea, but they were playing one of my favorite songs, Birdland, and it was extremely awesome. Kids are talented. Please keep up the arts. It, uh, it uh, does wonders for the soul and for everybody else. So um, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Next, moving on to item E1, the consent agenda items. Um, I will make a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. Second. Seconded by Christine Pritchard. Motion passes. Next, we have information item um, G1, Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, and members of cabinet. As part of our annual monitoring of governing board policy, we bring before you for the first read section 11. Um, this was presented to the board uh, previously last week, and you've had several days to look at it. If you have any questions, be happy to answer those questions. I just have a question um, for mm -hmm. clarification on 11.14 community use of school facilities. Um, just making sure that we're still um, ensuring that parent or student needs continue to take priority over community needs and <coughs> or community groups as far as, for an example, use of our auditoriums or buildings won't be opened up for community groups until it's after availability is determined once the student events are calendared. Are we still doing it? Uh, Madam President, Ms. Pritchard, that is correct. And as we look to uh, expand our community access to facilities throughout the district, whether it's playgrounds or auditoriums or what, what be it, students will always come first. Thank you. If there's no other questions or discussion, We'll move to um, item H2. Sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Oh my gosh. G2. Big difference. Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, and members of cabinet. We're very excited this evening to introduce you to some more of our very, very talented students. And Mr. Dean will introduce this item. Good evening, Madam President, members of the Governing Board, Dr. Kellis, and members of Cabinet. This evening, we're very excited to present to the Governing Board information related to the Dysart Student Broadcasting Program, or better known, DSB Live. The um, planning for this uh, new program that started this year began prior to uh, the COVID pandemic outbreak. However, it turned out to be incredibly timely um, to be able to provide services to our community at no cost. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the director of the program, and that is um, Brian Yoder. And Mr. Yoder, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Kellis and Cabinet, my name is Brian Yoder, the coordinator of Student Broadcast, and I've had the luxury of working with four amazing film and TV instructors and their students here this year. 
If without, without them, we wouldn't be here in this position. So um, before we get started, we'd love to turn it over to a video that was created by the Willow Canyon students. And uh, we have a little bit of wrestling action for you this afternoon. And welcome, DSP Live Student Broadcast here for the women's basketball game. Good evening and welcome to Shadow Ridge High School. This was the first year of Dysar Student Broadcasting and boy did we get a lot done. Action. <laughs> Team of schools Dysart, Willow Canyon, Valley Vista, and Shadow Ridge live streamed over 150 events. These events showcased the academic, artistic, and athletic talents of Dysart District students. Shoots it. What a goal. Off the crossbar and in for Shadow Ridge. Turner going to throw down the foot for Yates, and it is caught by Yates. Should be a touchdown. Mike Tinsel for three. Bang! This student-led initiative gives us an opportunity for hands-on work and learning. We had student announcers, student camera operators, and student directors. We also had students creating graphics and animations so we could put on such a great show. Using industry technology, students were able to bring live sports to parents, faculty, and staff during COVID restrictions. <laughs> here to help our school community during these difficult times. Each school now has its own Vimeo webpage, a central place for teachers, parents, and students to go to find engaging live streams and cool content created just by us. We hope to grow in the future, sharing even more live events and stories about our district to the surprise community. Thank you. And instead of you guys listening to me tonight, we thought it would be fun for the students to be able to share their perspective and what they were able to do. So tonight's first up is Dice Art High School. Hello, Dr. Callis and members of the board. My name is Andres Aguilar. I am a senior student in film and TV at Dice Art High School. Beside me is Ms. Haley Linderman our film and TV and DSB instructor. Here are a few things I would like to take away from my time in broadcast. We are not only just a team, I call our team a family. We learn a lot from post-production, pre-production, um, the ideologies behind film in general, how to work the graphics, and most importantly, the chords. So important. DSB Live is comprised of all four high schools, Dysart High, Shadow Ridge, Valley Vista, and Willow Canyon High Schools. We are on schedule to have completed over 200 live events in the areas of arts, academics, athletics, and we will be completing high school graduations at the Cardinal Stadium on May 19th. Each instructor will be the producer for their own student's graduation, and students will be running the whole productions themselves. All these graduations can be seen on vimeo.com slash DSB Live. Thank you. And as they transition to the next speaker, I might just indicate that they are DSB Live students are filming as we speak. So <laughs> practice in action. Hello, my name is Miranda Mathis from Shadow Ridge High School and standing behind me is my DSB Live instructor, Mr. Rodney Moore. I am a senior student at Shadow and I am planning on attending ASU in the fall to study sports journalism. I always knew I wanted to write in the future, but I didn't know where to take that. DSB Live has helped me realize exactly what I want to be involved in and that was the sports side of journalism. DSB has been a great opportunity for me and I've learned so much about what goes on into live broadcasts and different career fields I could possibly take on in the future. One of the essential pieces of our program is that it is student-centered, student-driven. 
You will see an adult play-by-play -play commentator at our games with a student serving as a color commentator. We went through a training at the beginning of the school year and the adults have helped us learn our craft in broadcasting. Like myself, some students are moving on to colleges and universities to do film and TV and we will rise above our class due to our experiences in DSB Live this school year. Hi everyone, I hope you're doing great. My name is Caleb Berwin and I'm a junior at Valley Vista High School. Unfortunately, Mr. Martinez couldn't make it today because of an anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> DSB Live coming to Valley Vista has been an incredible experience. I've taken on more of a leadership role. I've been able to mentor students and make more friends than I could have ever imagined. And now I have a potential career, career pathway lined out for me. It's, it's crazy what we've been able to do in just a year alone. Valley Vista alone has made 103 events completed by the end of this year. You can check them all out at diceart.org slash dsblive. This is the first year out of a three-year build, and I'm excited to see where it goes next. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lolo Crowell, and I am a sophomore at Willow Canyon High School. With me today, I have my film and broadcast, as well as my DSB instructor, Ms. Allison Tickemeyer. Throughout my time in DSB, I have come across many great opportunities. For example, this year I was able to conduct an interview with Mr. Matthew Earl Jones, our film commissioner for State of Arizona. And it was such a fun experience to hear what he does and the advice he gave to students in high school who might want to take work in the film industry. With the opportunities given this year, it gave me the benefit to open more before I came into DSB, I was a very shy person and always hid within my friend group. But that has all changed thanks to DSB. The list could go on and on, but here are a few things we as a community have accomplished this year. Dies Our Student Broadcasting, DSB Live, was developed in July of 2020. We created a unique logo and put ourselves on the map with student broadcasting in the state of Arizona. We have four high school instructors with the support of over 124 students. Just in the past year, we have done over 200 live events. We have connections with the City of Surprise and 18 businesses to share our stories. Each week, we share a story with Surprise TV to air on their channel as well. We have done productions in the arts, academics, and athletic areas. The list could go on, we are excited to move our work to the next level next school year as we hope to welcome in more students. I would like to thank you for your time and please welcome our director of CTE to the podium. Good evening, Madam President, Dr. Kellis, members of the board and community. When we talk about current technical education, this is career and technical education. Whenever we talk about DSB Live and what these kids are able to do after school with the equipment that we've been able to purchase for them and the work-based learning that they're getting, listen to them. Doesn't that get you excited? It gives me chills when I'm sitting listening to them talk and you know, bringing Brian on and, and coordinating this after school. Um, even during school sometimes we're hoping to get some of those um, great events going on but whenever you look at what we have going on and Brian congratulations on a very successful year Dr. Dean thank you for your support and the board for your support of this program because this has given our kids work-based learning that they truly needed with the TV broadcasting so thank you all so much Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Kellis and Cabinet, that's our, our report on DSP Live. Thank you, Governing Board members. If there's no questions, and we'll be happy to move to the next piece. Thank you very much. I just, I just wanted to add, um, I was just so impressed. I had the opportunity to be involved with the heat wave. I don't know, Dr. Kellis or Mr. Hicks, if you're familiar with that program. <laughs> but um, I, was a, I, was, I was invited to be a part of that. And just observing the students um, coordinate that whole program and their their knowledge and their professionalism was just amazing to watch so i have had first hand experience with that that you guys are just awesome and just incredible that you're able like at, at your age in high school you know to be able to just create programs and um, run them professionally and just have that knowledge base at, at your ages is just amazing so i'm so glad to have you all 
in our district running that program. It's wonderful. So thank you. Madam President, if I could also just add, as was mentioned in one of the presentations, um, it's a three-year build for the program. It's the objective that within those three years we have this professional program to the standard that the sponsorships will fund the entire program. And so it will be a self-sustaining, extraordinary experience for student learning. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, item G3, Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board and members of cabinet. This evening, the board will receive some information about what's happening in our community as it relates to our district and the, the growth in our district. And Mr. Ken Hicks will introduce this item. Thank you very much, Dr. Kellis. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Kellis, colleagues and community members. Let me, I'd like to introduce Mr. Kevin Shipman, our planning administrator, and he's just going to go through a report on our growth uh, within our district and some demographic information. Thank you, Ken. President Dinsmore, members of the board, Dr. Kells, cabinet, and the public. Um, as we discuss our district enrollment, let's first consider the biggest drivers of that growth that we see in the district. So this uh, is an illustration of the Maricopa Association of Governments um, projections for our district's population over the next um, 30 years. The green bars are population, and then the blue is the total growth. And what's noteworthy here especially is that there's approximately 35,000 new residents expected within the district from that growth uh, over the next 10 years. So again, as we think about those biggest drivers of those large enrollment increases um, that we could see, uh, certainly the population growth uh, that comes from the housing boom is, is responsible for that. This chart displays our K-8 enrollment history and forecast. Of course, uh, this year, as we saw nationwide, districts and schools saw a decrease uh, from the, the outcome of the pandemic as kindergartners were, were withheld, homeschoolers and other students just weren't present for school. So um, as you can see, our, our enrollment forecast is a little bit lower based on that change that we saw in the last year. However, um, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what happens in the future. And as you can see, we are expected to grow several thousand K-8 students in the next few, few years here. So, And of course, we'll be monitoring this closely, especially trends in the near term, so that we can better understand what's going to happen post-pandemic with our enrollment. So as we look at enrollment and enrollment capacity, it's helpful that we just briefly define that. So this is a hypothetical set of classrooms, and as we look at what the SFB, the School Facilities Board, defines as capacity, they're just looking at uh, a, a straight square footage rate for each school with some excluded spaces. And then our architects or engineers who develop the school, they'll have a design capacity. And then of course, there's exceptions to that capacity, right? When we have a kindergarten room that may only have a capacity of, let's say, 27 students. And then of course, and, and this is noteworthy here, is that we have special programs where we may have a room that has only 10 or 12 students that's absolutely fully utilized. And it's important that we point that out just as we look at what we're defining as capacity and how we're utilizing the facilities that we have available. So, so you can see that the School Facilities Board says we're at 68% of our capacity. And as we look at design capacity and then our actual utilization based on what's actually going on in our classrooms and our facilities, you can see we're right about 78%. And these are current numbers. So uh, pre-pandemic, we were more maybe 82% or so. So I think it's uh, important to note that as we uh, look at our enrollment. And then this is the same information. It's our K facility utilization by school. So you can see for the most part, our schools are pretty full. Um, this is interesting because if you look at one particular school, like let's say you were to look at Countryside Elementary, for example, if you looked at the SFB or design capacity numbers, you might think that, oh, that's, that school has, you know, 60% enrollment or something like that. But really, when you look at how that space is being utilized and where we place our programs, um, there's definitely more utilization there than you might consider. So, so this is a map of our development activity. Um, we monitor this regularly. It doesn't probably look too much different than when we showed you last year. Certainly there's a lot more in the pipeline right now. That's the pre-development activity before they begin to break ground. 
And definitely it's really noteworthy that despite the pandemic, there's a, a significant increase in all of this activity. There's a huge pent up demand nationwide for housing, obviously that's driven uh, the price is up. And so you can see, especially in the north part of the district and then in the southwest, there's a lot of growing growth occurring. So, um, And then we're going to take a quick look at these three particular schools and look at their forecasted enrollment over the next five years. So Sonoran Heights and Mountain View are in the southwest portion of the district. Um, and certainly their enrollment this year took a bump. We'll expect to see uh, the majority of that return or perhaps more. And then both of those schools in the next five years are expected to see some pretty significant growth. We do know that Sonoran Heights um, is merging with Rancho Gabriela Elementary School as part of our middle school K-4 model. So that will help absorb some of that growth. But again, we'll be following that area closely just to make sure um, we're, we're keeping track of the growth that's occurring. And then Asante Preparatory Academy. So um, in the last year or two, we had some very large numbers forecasted up there. And despite the pandemic, we're really seeing healthy growth up there and the building and construction activity is really significant. So obviously you can see that we expect over 2000 students up in that Northern area here in the next five years. So. So as we look at that development activity, and then this map also just includes where we have our K-8 sites, um, as well as where we have existing properties or um, identified or pending school sites that are identified in a plan. So I think this is useful just uh, uh, as a reminder of the work that we continue to do where we are making sure we're positioning the, the district for future growth and making sure we're ready for that new building activity as it occurs. Um, this is our high school enrollment uh, forecast. So we've been working with the state, or I should say having conversations with the state about maybe do, does our high school growth trigger the need for a high school that the state would, would fund in the next 10 years? And certainly there's, um, I think, maybe more uncertainty with those high school numbers given the pandemic. So we'll be following really closely the next six months, see what happens with our enrollment trends so we can get a better idea of what's gonna happen with high school in the next five or 10 years. Um, the high school capacities are a little more ambiguous because you have different periods, you have labs, you have um, just a lot of more moving parts, and so I think there's a little more room there to, to place kids. Um, but you can see we, we definitely had a dip in enrollment in our high schools, and um, all the schools are, are relatively full. They have healthy enrollment populations, and we'll continue to keep a close eye on them. So, And with that, I'd stand for any questions. I do have one question, um, Mr. Shipman. Um, I'm glad you understand the nuts and bolts of all this stuff. Um, but my one question has to do with um, uh, the capacity or, let me see, the projection, the forecasted five-year enrollment. Um, you have Sonoran Heights, you have Mountain View, and then we have Asante. So we know that that development out there, or excuse me, several developments that are out there um, will continue and continuing and um, is that correct in regards to 2,500 or more than 2,500? Because our schools can only take so much before we would have to do something else with that particular area. So you're projecting more than 2,500? Yes, that's right. Madam President, uh, Member Sawyer Sinkbell, so um, there is uncertainty I would be surprised if that number is somewhere at, let's say, 1,500 or 1,800. We do expect that student population. That is for the entire boundary for Asante, and so there's all the development around Asante, um, but then we have the Cortland properties, and then we have Rancho Mercado, which is up in the very corner of the district that most people don't notice. Um, but we're, we're talking about thousands of homes coming up here in the near term. So um, yeah, that's a reasonable number. Um, and if, if you can, you can drill down to the data, see the permits lighting up, see all the activity and the, and the pre-development activity that's going on or the grading. Um, yes, so, so that does pose an important question of, of what happens when we get to that point, so. Because our schools, um, I mean, before when it was Desert Moon was, um, had the capacity of 1,100, I believe. Mm -hmm. So 
what are we going to do in order to look at this and decide um, in regards to boundaries or another school? What, Dr. Kellis? Madam President, Ms. Sawyer Sinkbell, you mentioned a couple of those options right there. Is boundary changes could be an option? Adding an additional school uh, could be an option. Um, what typically happens when a neighborhood grows and surprises the, the poster child for growth over, over the last 10, 15 years, when we were building at sometimes two and sometimes three schools a year to keep up with capacity, um, we're starting to see evidence of that in certain parts of the district, certainly not district-wide, but while we could change boundaries, um, the state would say that they look at the entire district and all of our portfolio of buildings to determine if there's still capacity. You saw a chart that had a lot of green along the top. That's what the state would say. You still have empty seats in these schools. Now, it's not reasonable. It's possible, but we could bus students from El Mirage or from Asante to El Mirage or from Asante to uh, the center of the district. Um, but in, real, in reality, when you have growth, you build schools. That's a huge number. <laughs> that is a huge number when the schools can only hold 1,100, 1,200 maybe. So that, that's a real big concern because five years is going to be here within a matter of minutes. <laughs> I think it's something that you may um, see around our neighborhood is you see, well, there's a new school right there that just got built, and there's another new school right there that just got built. Those are not district dicer schools. Those are charter schools that don't have to go through the same process that the district goes through. So they can just take out a loan and build a school without any voter um, approval, even though they're still using tax dollars to build those schools and, and staff them. So as the district goes and looks at the growth and the potential need for the future, um, we would look at right now starting those conversations, um, as was mentioned with the state facilities board to determine, let's get ahead of this and let's, let's uh, hopefully get some properties acquired as soon as possible. As I remember the time when we were building, like you said, building two to three schools a year and we just had that big, it was just a big boom of growth and uh, uh, poor Mr. Thompson was just running around here like his head was cut off. Um, I, it was a very busy time and I just don't want to um, get caught. I do understand the capacity as far as the district as a whole, um, but this can be very concerning with a five-year projection. So something to think about. Well, and just looking at the five years, um, I mean, there's no way we can wait. If this is correct, you know, that first line or that second line is at 1,000 and, you know, goes up from there. So, mm -hmm. so how soon will we be looking at, because I know several years ago we were saying that even though our, our buildings were um, meant to hold like 1,100 students, once you get to about 950 to 1,000, it starts impacting quality of instruction, just too many kids in classrooms and buildings. So how soon will we be looking at because I mean even if it just gets to a thousand just barely I mean that's that's just barely up the graph right here so how soon will we need to be looking at some of these alternatives we can't wait five years Madam President Ms. Pritchard um, thank you for that question it is a uh, a weighty matter for sure because we're not talking about what ifs um, the ground has been broken and the the framing has started the the families have moved in but the framing has started on all of these homes in these very hot spots um, as far as how soon it usually from pencil to pencil and paper putting design plans in place to the first day when we open the doors is about a three-year process so if we were to anticipate um, as you looked at that chart for asante um, where they're pushing 2,800 students. Clearly, we're not going to put 2,800 students in one school. Um, it would be within two to three years that we're already pushing probably 1,800. And then in, over the next couple of years after that, uh, uh, being up to nearly 3,000. So now is the time. Um, as, as I just mentioned, um, we can't just go to the bank and get a loan to build a school. Uh, we don't have $25 million to build an, an elementary school, and that's uh, 
through voter initiatives that we're able to purchase and build those new schools. And um, it, it's unfortunately the process that, that we have at our disposal. But I mean, so then therefore, since that's a much longer process, are we looking at boundary changes soon for that particular area? Uh, Madam President, Ms. Pritchard, if necessary, that would be the solution. There's another solution where we can increase the capacity of a school by moving portable classrooms, put them on a trailer, haul them out there and plant them on a playground. Um, that's also expensive because then you have to run all the utilities underground and overground to make those, uh, those facilities part of a school. We call them portables or modules, modulars. Um, so there are interim things, boundary changes is one. Um, I know that the board has, some members of the board have experienced uh, boundary changes and parents like to go to their neighborhood school. And when that's not possible, it becomes very frustrating. So we'll address this though one way or another before it gets to the part where it impacts student learning. So bef you know, before we are at 1,500 kids, which I mean. It's even too many. That, right, that's, that's what many. I'm saying. Before you can get to that point, but 1,500 compared to 2,500 sounds like you know way in advance. But we can't even get to that point. So is this something we're going to be looking at over the next school year? Madam Pritchard, uh, Madam President, Ms. Pritchard, uh, we're looking at it now. But as far as coming to the board with recommendations for boundary changes, um, we should anticipate something similar. Or if we can buy another year with portable classroom movements, um, it will be within the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Thank you. I just have one question. I mean, along the same line, I mean, we're talking Asante and the growth out there, but that's with the assumption that these are all kids K through eight. What about the high school? I mean, what, what's the impact going to be on our high schools? I mean, I realize we don't know when somebody buys a house, if they have children, how old their children are, but what's the impact going to be then on our high schools as well? Madam President, Ms. Grant, uh, even though we don't know for certain we have formulas that can yeah. pretty accurately uh, predict the population of kinder and high school students. Um, so yes, we can look at the demographics as we are very, very uh, frequently and readily and we can make those same projections. Ouch. Any other questions? Mm -mm. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Moving to item G4, Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, and members of cabinet. Mr. Hicks will introduce this item. Good evening. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Kellis, colleagues, and community members. Thank you very much for allowing me to present the Arizona Auditor General uh, School District Spending Report. This was a report that um, was concluded, I want to say February 28th, but I think it was emailed out to the board the first week in, um, in March. Um, I think I put an email out to the board, just a little quick little summary of some things and highlights. Um, I I think I was scheduled to uh, present on this earlier, but um, uh, such packed agendas, we've moved this back a little bit. So this is just really brief. The really good news is, is that a lot of our projections, when I show you the rainbow report, were all spot on. So congratulations to Ms. Mary Dell Spidell and her um, Ms. Lisa Smith, who did all the projections and told me, here's what we expect is gonna show on the Auditor General report. And they were exactly on, on every single one of them. So uh, when I come to, our, our, um, to the Rainbow Report, you'll, you'll see that. Um, one part, so here's the beginning of the report, just to highlight um, state, um, uh, the, the state level uh, per pupil. And they talk about the teacher average uh, teacher salary increased uh, to 54. 814, a 13.3% increase over 2017, but short of the 15% cumulative goal. This in and of itself just highlights and summarizes the issue we have, a lot of school districts, with the Auditor General Report. The assumption is, is that we didn't give a 15% raise, which we did give a 15% raise, but they're making the assumption that every single employee stays in every single district so that everybody got the 15% raise. We gave a 15% raise, but you have people retiring, you have people leaving, they come in at a lesser amount. 
they don't get the full uh, raise in that sense. And, and so there's movement in that. And so that is um, part of why we have problems with some of these Auditor General reports. They make big grandiose statements and then walk away and not go down into the detail of that. Um, so I've just uh, snipped a few of the part of the report. I put at your, up uh, by your, on your desk on there, um, the full report. It's just a one pager. Um, they're required to do it um, every year. We send our books, our general ledger to the Auditor General after you approve our AFR. We send them everything um, by, uh, in October. Uh, they put it all together and then report out on all school districts. This is just school districts, so uh, charter schools don't apply. They uh, not having to require and, um, and, and present this information. Um, and so the first one we normally look at is um, our classroom spending. And um, a lot of times I'm just really looking at, it, it doesn't say a ton of context, this is per pupil. Um, but I do look at the total operational. So if you look at the district, uh, we did increase our spending. We did get the, um, as we were talking about the 20 for 20, 20 by 2020 and additional funding and inflationary funding. Uh, so we went up from 81.75 to 85.85, but you could see per our peer averages and the state averages, we are still below our, and the peer averages is a large group. Um, so we are, well, I think technically with the Auditor General, we're categorized as extra large. And we, um, with our size, we're one of the uh, 10 largest districts in the state. And so they categorize us with those. And you can see we're, we spend a little bit less than them. And from a state average, we spend a lot less. Uh, we get a lot less. Um, so um, a lot of times I'm saying we do uh, more with less um, in that sense. And as you've heard from previous uh, presentations, we have equalized funding in Arizona. So the same student gets the same amount everywhere else. It's all the auxiliary funding, which could be um, additional voter uh, approved incentives, um, either a capital override, a bond, um, a bond project, and what that does is a lot of times that picks up the capital load and then districts will transfer over the capital into m and and then spend it there. Um, and sometimes there's districts with higher poverty, there's districts receiving more funds, more grants, and so that, that um, makes up for the difference. You look at the very bottom, the total per pupil, so you have the top operational is, is basically your m and but other grants that are m and like You have capital, the total non-operational below, uh, for a grand total. So we're at 92, almost 9,300. Our peer groups are 10, 4, 10, 5. Um, and then the state average is 11, 1. So we are spending, we're getting a lot less and spending a lot less than the state. So we are very efficient and effective with the use of our funding. They do um, produce um, average teacher salary or, um, across all districts. And you can see where the um, higher line. Um, and so uh, this last year, we came out at 58,334, so uh, we are uh, $3,500 above the state average uh, for teachers. Um, this is something that was new last year that was just uh, the top part of the graph um, is just showing the difference over the last five years of where the money has moved. No surprise, student support went up because if you remember, one of the big things we did is we implemented social workers at every single one of our schools, which is categorized in the student support. And so we, um, you can see a lot more money moving into that category uh, with decreases in administration, plant operations, food service, and transportation over that time. This is a new one. The bottom half is the lowest and highest. So they're trying to just create a little bit more um, descriptive data to um, say, hey, over the last uh, 19 years, um, what are the highest and lowest amounts in the classroom spent on instructional spending? The lowest being 50.8 when it first started, and now in the highest in 2006, 59.4. After that, uh, normally I, th I it hovered around there. It dropped after all day kindergarten was cut, all the cuts to capital, all the cuts to m and all the cuts to the classroom and funding, and so that uh, drove it down. Uh, but you can see in our last two most recent years, um, we moved up to 57.2, and then we continued another half percent up uh, this last year. This is also a new indicator on the report. It's just how much in federal funding from the COVID relief was being spent by the district and our peer group. Uh, we spent $1,500. That was all in our ESG. So we did spend a little bit money in ESG and um, our FEMA, DEMA money. Um, not all of it. We received um, 5.2 million from, uh, from the state uh, for continuous um, continuing our education um, enrollment stability grant. Um, 5.2. We spent 1.5 last year. The the rest of the ESG will be spent in this fiscal year, and then there are some additional COVID funds. So the ESSER funds, ESSER one two, 
will also be reflective in this fiscal year, so next year's report. Here's the um, hard to see uh, rainbow report, but it did not change from the December, so I'm not gonna focus too much on this. Um, really the only thing, oh, I forgot to take it off, is the pink down, or the purple down below where it says AG's estimated calculation. I uh, forgot to take off the estimated because it's now actual, but none of the numbers changed because our uh, top-notch staff did a great job with projections, so it's all fully in line. Um, and so really there's, uh, I don't wanna belabor and just talk about the rainbow report and everything because nothing really changed from December. We'll be doing it again. I do it for every uh, budget revision. So when we revise our budget, um, May 12th, um, I'll update this and then I'll go into it a little bit more. And so I will stand for any comments or questions and comments. I have a question regarding um, the transportation as far as operational measures relative to peer averages. What do you think is keeping our costs high to very high compared to our neighbors? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So not snipped on, but if you look at the report, you could see that it's red and, uh, and orange, which is the very high. Now that's not the cost um, that we're spending because on the previous graph, you see that we're spending less or in the previous uh, descriptive data, transportation at $351 per pupil, we're spending less than our peer average and less than our state average. But for that descriptive data of looking at the cost per mile and the cost per rider is high, which um, is very indicative of, we also have above average uh, special ed costs, special ed enrollment. Um, we have, and a special ed bus costs a lot more, has less riders and uh, puts more miles. So the cost is higher on all those. So that just on the surface is a quick explanation of why are our costs higher on the per mile and per rider is, um, I believe we have around 18% of our population special ed and we have a high amount of IEPs that require transportation and that funnels into the higher cost. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hicks, um, is there anything, any type of legislation or anything that's coming about that will hopefully, eventually require charter schools to complete um, a report just like this? Uh, Madam President, members of the board, no. Nothing at all? Because I know, I know that they're, they're not required to complete any type of report like this. And um, it is um, very concerning when once in a while you will hear on the news that a charter school has uh, had uh, mismanagement of funds and um, they are not detailing the per cost for anything, for per, per pupil spending or, or anything. And so there's nothing, there's no legislator that is actually trying to lead the charge with this. Um, Madam President, members of the board, uh, no. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Hicks? Thank you very much for your update. <clears throat> All right, item G5, Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President. Members of the board and members of cabinet, Mr. Hicks will introduce this item as well. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Kellis, colleagues, community members. I'm very happy to be back um, with a presentation. <laughs> uh, seems like it's been forever since I talked to you. Um, so this is the accumulation of uh, a process that uh, started uh, back in October uh, with our IBA negotiations uh, meet and confer team. Um, taking a look at what we recommended the previous year, what actually happened, looking at our annual financial report, fund balances, where everything is. We kind of just look at all balances, where everything is, take a look at that. We then look a little bit at um, benefits, and then we do meet with the governing board um, to get direction uh, from the governing board back in January uh, so that it can help guide this process, and you'll see that embedded um, in, in this recommendation. This recommendation is, um, it is uh, an information only, it is not an action item, um, and that is because 
Um, we will be uh, listening for the board and comments at the end of this process or throughout, but uh, there are t a lot of agenda items, whether changing hiring schedules, um, notice of employment going out, placement schedules, MOUs with changes in our MOUs that are all going to change after this presentation, after hearing the board. So um, if there's any concerns or anything, please talk to us. Um, but uh, there will be probably a handful of different agenda items over the next two months that will all embed all of these recommendations into those, pr into those presentations and action items. So although this does not an official act action item, please um, give us some feedback on that. Um, here is the team. Um, uh, that that uh, represents uh, all the different groups uh, from the district. Uh, we have the Dysart Education Association for our certified staff, Dysart classified staff representatives, our Dysart school administrators, and Dysart cabinet rep, uh, representatives, um, and as well as uh, Mr. Crodo, Dr. Croto and myself uh, that help facilitate the whole process. The process uh, does take time. We do a lot of talking. Um, we start, um, although we start a little bit looking at the finances from the previous year, uh, we do make sure that um, everybody has a chance. We're trying to make a safe place that anybody could say anything, question anything, question any cost, question whatever we're doing so that we feel like we're going forward with the best uh, options possible. So it's not a, a, a flat line, straight line process. It's very dynamic, it's a lot of, discussion in there. We do make sure and we validate um, our recommendations against the board adopted standards. And so those standards, legal, affordable, alignment, sustainable, viable, efficiency, necessity, judicious, and equitable, uh, we read through that. We make sure that everybody understands that, that our recommendations going forward uh, do not violate any of these. And so um, there is a, a check and balance process on that. So as I said, we start with telling the story uh, where each group comes from. Uh, we identify interests, what the direction they'd like to go, find common ground. We brainstorm, look at options to solve all of those. We layer in the direction from the governing board to make sure that we're on the right path. We evaluate them against our standards to make sure we're not violating anything. And then we go with consensus. So everything being recommended has a consensus approach, meaning that if one person says they're not for this, then we have to keep talking about it, modify it, better explain it, or take it off. And so that is the process that we work through. Just as a reminder, um, back in February, um, the governing board already approved a 3% retention stipend. So this is just a reminder of that. And we reminded the group of that. Um, also in February, the governing board approved our benefits package because uh, we're in open enrollment right now with our benefits. So we had to do that a little bit sooner. So that happens before and that had our benefits. It did have some premium rate changes. As you remember, some up and down um, and some hold steady and changed the HSA contribution. The state retirement cost um, increased as well. And so we already had to make sure that we took into account those expenses. One of the recommendations um, from the group uh, was to look at, this was a uh, recommendation that was made at the end of last year for this year's um, IBA and meet and confer team, which was to extend the, vac the time for exempt and hourly staff to use vacation. Uh, we extended it to December 31st. Um, and that was because at the end of last year, we had the pandemic hit us. A lot of people got moved to home. There was, uh, nobody could travel, nobody could take vacations. And so we wanted to create an opportunity for them to have more time so they didn't use it or lose it. And so this created an opportunity for them to use more. Um, since then, um, uh, the group said, let's go back to the October 31st. Um, travel's been open, people can take time. People should take time for themselves, even if it's a uh, just stay home day, staycation in that sense. And so we are, recommending that we roll this back to October 31st. As part of the process, as we're looking through um, all the other recommendations and looking at what we had available for compensation, the group um, voted on um, and we are recommending a 1.3% increase to the base pay for all current positions. Part of what was approved last year during the IBA meet and confer process was to help a little bit with decompression was to can we increase our new higher placement schedule, which was how about the, the proposal last year that was approved was whatever the raises 
to our current employees, the hiring placement schedules will be increased by one half of that. And so this falls in line with that recommendation, which so if 1.3 is what all staff are getting, then this is um, increasing those placement schedules by 0.65%. If somebody has already come um, before the board for hiring starting next year, um, they were using the current placement schedule that did not have that, they would be eligible for that 0.65% increase not the 1.3% if they're not an employee, they're not a current employee. Going on to some uh, MOU um, stipends, um, create a lead nurse addenda of 3,150 per year. Uh, we noticed that we had a lead um, addenda out there that was not being used and um, is somewhat redundant to another addenda. And so we're asking to eliminate the lead adaptive PE physical, uh, physical education teacher addenda 3150. And then also create a lead um, ESS specialist addenda of 3150 per year. We're also recommending um, to change the high school drama addenda to high school theater. So name change and then modify currently right now it allows for uh, one in the fall and one in the spring, one play in the fall, one in the spring. We would like to double that to two plays for the fall and two plays for the spring, each semester getting the 2042. So it's basically doubling that. Create an um, ESS hard to fill addenda at $1,500. There currently is for three groups, ESS, um, special ed, uh, math and science currently get a hard to fill stipend addenda of $1,500, then the next year, it, that's the first year they're coming in, then the second year as a retention, it drops to 1,000. This is to uh, create a, a new line, which is for ESS hard to fill, and it stays at 1,500 and does not go down. So we would still have the hard to fill addenda and the retention addenda for hard to fill physicians. Those are just for the math and science, and those would stay as is with no changes. This would only be keeping the, keeping the ESS hard to fill addenda at the 1500. So they come in, it does not drop after the first year. So that would be providing a $500 increase to all ESS teachers, uh, all staff that are re receiving that. Um, another request was um, to create a DSB Live addenda for up to 4,000 per semester per high school based on criteria. And um, the criteria, I think uh, Mr. Dean, uh, Dr. Dean uh, presented some information on the number of um, shows or activities or events that they're um, hosting or doing. Currently, right now, this has a very little cost increase because they're currently getting paid on timesheets. So the budget's already out there to provide some timesheets for them. This is to have our teachers stop putting in timesheets to get paid for all the events. We're just gonna do a stipend uh, for them and they could do uh, based on the number of uh, events that they host. There's also was a request um, to increase our CTSO sponsor addendum from uh, 2042 up to $3,000 per year per qualified activity. Uh, this is not paid through MNO, but just uh, ran through the same process. And this is using our CTE funds uh, to fund this increase. It does align with a lot of the uh, school districts around us as well. This request is to create two specialized program nurse positions. Um, currently, we have health service assistants filling these positions, so we would eliminate the health service of positions, create the two specialized program nurse positions, and move uh, to place them on uh, grade W uh, for an increase in pay, which is more aligned to the criteria or the qualifications that are needed to be compliant uh, for the um, services that they're providing in this specialized program. I believe this is in our Aspire program um, that has some high need students that have higher need uh, um, service needed to them. And so this would align a position with those increased uh, qualifications. Would that be, uh, Mr. Hicks, would that be uh, LPN or RN? It's depending on the need. Uh, you could turn on your microphone. Dr. Croto will help with that. Madam President, um, Member Sawyer Sinkville, uh, the, the answer is both to that, depending on the child's needs. Uh, the, the lowest um, qualification is an LPN, but sometimes the um, needs of the student require an RN. So, um, and it's based on uh, what's written in the student's IEP and the needs of care. All right, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, the next request is um, focused on our special ed uh, paraprofessionals, and this would be recommending to move um, our special ed paraprofessional uh, from grade D to grade F. So this would create a, uh, our resource-based paraprofessionals. So grade D is currently um, 12, 15, and grade F would be moving them to uh, 13.72, so a $1.57 uh, base raise for everybody uh, that qualifies on that. This would then now create a tier. So right now all of our paraprofessionals are on one. We would then now break off and have a modified um, special special ed paraprofessional specialized positions. So we're calling it uh, specialized positions uh, to, to differentiate. And these are in our Aspire, one-to-ones, our preschool, our VI vision impairment program, our STC program, and our PBS programs. So those specialized positions in those programs would then be going from grade D to grade H. Uh, grade H is 1439, so they would be getting a $2.24 um, raise per hour. Along that same, we would be moving our ESS behavior technician and the preschool or special ed preschool facilitator from the grade age to a grade L. Um, grade H is the 1439, grade L is 1591. Um, part of the conversation as we were ending um, was reminded that um, this is to help uh, with a lot of vacancies and a lot of turnover that we've had in our paraprofessionals that are impacting our special ed programs, our ESS programs. And then the thought was, well, we have bus aides that uh, service uh, that are on buses just for our special ed programs and that we um, should be uh, in an equitable move, uh, should be moving our bus aides from the grade B to grade F to align with the lower of those three tiers of those uh, specialized uh, positions, which that would be the resource special ed paraprofessional. And so that would be moving them from the 1215 um, up to the um, 1372 position as well. Um, one uh, thought just to make sure everybody was on the same page and just for clarification that when uh, what commonly happens now is uh, right now they're all paid the same. Our specialized, our resource are paid the same. And so positions, people will get hired into the resource uh, position, but then uh, a vacant position in one of our specialized program, specialized programs, and we'll just move the resource over to the specialized because that is uh, more IEP and more uh, needed and uh, more Im impactful on the student. And so we could have other solutions to solve the other um, vacancy. Um, but now that we're creating a differential in pay, um, it would be unfair to move someone, hire them at a lower, move them and have them do the job of the higher and not pay them. So we're requesting that uh, paraprofessionals who work 10 consecutive days in the specialized or ESS behavior te technician position will get paid at the rate of those positions. So they might be able to fill in a day or two here or there, but if it's gonna be somewhat permanent, we need to pay them at the higher rate. Uh, so Mr. Hicks, um we have uh, several vacancies that had not been filled, correct? So how many did we have for this year that were not filled? Madam President, Member Sawyer Sinkbill, um, I don't know the exact number, but if I was to estimate off the top of my head, that would probably be um, around 60 to 70 paraprofessional jobs that are not filled. And, and, I, uh, I think I remember I think I remember you saying something about 63. I don't Correct. know why that's sticking out, so I was wondering if, if that was still true to form. It's true to form, and I can get you an exact number if you like, but it's a very large number um, of those vacancies right now. And uh, Madam President, members of the board, just to clarify, I believe the 63 number was already projected for next year, um, not currently in hand, or that might have been the exact amount on that day. We do um, also, we will contract to bring in uh, Paris um, also. And so we have contracted up to anywhere around 40 at that time, but we're paying a much higher cost when we contract out. Um, and so this, we believe, will create a better system in place to fill those vacancies. Uh, continuing on, um, in the special ed world or the ESS world, we're also looking to create a contract addenda for occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech language pathologists of $3,000 per year. This would not be funded out of MNO. We would move this to the classroom site fund with the 
uh, passage of um, SB 1139, it collapsed the buckets, but it also expanded the usage of classroom siphon that allowed student support services. And so these are now eligible. We cannot take some of our current MNO equivalent because there still is a non-supplanting in there. So we, part of our standards is to make sure that it's uh, legal um, and, and sustainable. Um, and so uh, we were not able to move um, the existing over, but we are, since this is a brand new one, we're uh, recommending a 3,000 for, uh, per year for each one of those. The goal on that is to um, be competitive um, and in the marketplace be able to bring back some of, I believe, um, I believe we have 28 um, that we outsource in those groups currently right now and we pay a lot more when we outsource and so if we continue to increase our current fund, uh, current compensation to those now, we would be able to retain the ones we have and then also uh, uh, hopefully attract new ones in so that we could reduce our outsourcing, our reliance on outsourcing of those positions as well. Um, and so uh, that would be recommended to come through the classroom side fund. The current staff, um, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about classroom side fund a little bit, a few minutes, or next slide maybe. Um, the current staff um, were also, we do have, I think it's roughly 55 positions um, funded through MNO, which we call the MNO equivalent. I think there's about 80 positions total from other funding sources as well that receive what we call the MNO equivalent of 301. And that is uh, way back when, when Prop uh, 301 was first passed back in 2000. Um, it uh, the definitions were not fully defined, and so we were paying some positions out of that. Um, the law changed, or the attorney general came out with specifics that said you can't pay them out of that, so we moved them out, and instead of taking away the funding from those people, we grandfathered them and just said, we'll pay you out of m and and so we called it the m and equivalent. Um, and so um, what we're also recommending uh, from this group is to continue to mirror our classroom site fund, so the m and equivalent for those 55 positions will go up uh, from $9,000 now up to 10500 in accordance with what we're recommending for classroom site fund for our certified staff as well. We're also recommending uh, two calendar moves. Um, uh, so we have two dispatchers and two routing technicians, or routing technician one and routing technician two. They're both on a 229 day calendar. Uh, we ask them to work extra days and it mirrors almost the 248 uh, calendar right now. So almost no cost as well. But if we keep asking them to work the same calendar, why don't we just move them to that calendar? So this is a request to move them to the calendar. Also move the ESS specialist uh, from the 197 day calendar to the 222 day calendar. They also get additional day pay up to 20. Um, so this does come with a small little cost, not all of them take it, but we, uh, through the professional de development, the training, the curriculum needed and the planning, um, they're mostly there. And so we're asking to this move to the calendar so we know they're all there um, all the time. Um, some assumptions just to make sure. I know um, I talk to the board a lot about you should know um, some things and uh, maybe some board members have been interviewed by our auditors and um, I do say you should know what is our budget. Uh, we could make up any number of students and create a huge budget uh, and do whatever and then have, uh, the, have a lot of debts to pay at some point with that, so that would be bad. So uh, what you see is a budget um, that's looking at it from this year, a growth of 400 students. Um, previously, a couple presentations ago, you saw uh, Mr. Shipman make a presentation. I think if I saw, he had about 600 elementary kid increase and about 85 high school kid increase, so almost 700 increase. We are not um, budgeting that we would have that full increase. One, um, his projections are normally through the whole year, so um, you have to, we only get funded through the first 100 days, so not all would materialize as an ADM increase. Um, and, but we do know that with our approximately 800 student loss now, uh, from last year to this year, some are coming back. A lot of it's COVID related. Um, we're not gonna have a missed year if you're talking 50,000 students statewide. We do believe some will be coming back. Uh, we do have growth, but we're just not planning on all of it coming back. So we're taking a more conservative approach and moving it down um, to, it's actually a little less than half of what 
uh, the growth um, would dictate in that sense. We do have the increased base support level, so inflation funding is supporting uh, increase in pay, uh, uh, f revenue. Uh, the final 20 for 2020 increase, which was paid last year, but paid in the classroom site fund, we gave the raise in the current year out of M&O, and, um, and so um, I just don't want to get that double counted, so I try to make sure that the teachers and everybody understands that I'm going to include it in the revenues, but I'm also going to include the expense of it because we already gave the raise last year, and I don't want to give a raise twice for getting only one payment. Um, we continue to see the restoration of additional, district additional assistance, so even though the budget, uh, the state budget is not done uh, right now, they have um, per statute that they've already approved was the restoration of capital coming into this year. So we anticipate that increase happening. And as you know, with the retention stipend, we're getting uh, federal funds supporting, um, and they're also supporting some capital increase. So I will also mention that uh, at the end of the slide show too. Um, as I talked about classroom site fund, that increase going from 9,000 to 10,500. So it's an increase of $800 in our performance pay fund. Um, for a total of $4,500. Um, and so I know that the performance, uh, pay for performance plan um, is being worked on for next year and still um, has that piece to go through. So you'll still be looking at that for approval, uh, but this is just the funding associated with it. And then we're looking at an increase of $700 um, for eligible uh, teacher of the 700 uh, of funds 11 and 13. Um, for a total of 6,000. So that's the increase going up from 9,000 to 10,500 for our certified, eligible certified staff. Uh, so basically our, all of our classroom teachers get this. Um, so 3% retention stipend, 1.3% on the base, and also for the classroom site fund going up $1,500, which is just under 3% equivalent on their average salary. Um, Another change that has happened, I think a couple board members heard this during a CIP presentation, uh, which was um, a change with our dual enrollment. Um, so right now, students that um, are pay through our Maricopa Community College um, District um, that sign up and pay tuition and complete a course, uh, they get credit um, and they pay for that. The, the community college re re um, refunds or... Um, reimburses the district back some of those costs. So the cost of operating the program, since we're operating the program, students are getting the um, tuition at a low rate and able to, as you heard in one high school sense, you could come out with an associate's degree um, and the district receives some funds. So um, currently right now, just looking out over the last four years, we did a little analysis to see we, we've been purchasing supplies, supplemental curriculum and devices has been the number one and it's really random. There's no continued use. A lot of times it looks like uh, a high school principal will wait until there's a uh, sum of money in there and then they'll decide to use it. And then they wait a couple years and then they buy something big. What we're pro proposing is to take 45% of the funding that comes in and move it to a teacher addenda. Um, part of this, um, personally, I think is a good idea just because I think four years ago, the requirements changed uh, from the American Community College districts of teachers and their qualifications, and they actually had to start paying, and it was more difficult to be certified to be a dual enrollment teacher. So it got a little bit more difficult, um, and they had to have a little bit more skin in the game. And so this is aligning to a payment structure, uh, providing addenda based on the number of paid and completed students. Um, so uh, at the end of the year, we would work with our research department to find out how many students um, had been enrolled and paid, and then how much the Maricopa County Community College Districts, mainly Rio Salado, has uh, paid back the district, and we would take, and we would make uh, these appro these um, addendas to those teachers of record uh, in the system, and so they would be making, uh, getting back some of the money, which um, we've already heard some positive comments that they believe will help drive enrollment and incentivize teachers to want to, because a lot of times right now you'll ask them and they'll just say no, I don't want to have to go pay my own money to take the test or go get trained and do all of that. So there's some barriers and we hope that this would help eliminate some of those barriers so that we could increase some of those dual, dual enrollment opportunities across the district. So just in total, um, I'd like to go through just uh, really, I don't think I could say the word quickly anymore since I've been talking for a while, uh, but uh, just summarizing our inflation, um, even though there's an increase, we had a decrease this year and so I have to account for that decrease. Um, and also same with the bridge where the money came in somewhere else, we already gave the M&O raise. 
Um, and so I count for that on the revenue side, but then I take it away uh, on the expense side. Um, this proposal recommendation in front of you does have a district additional assistance transfer. So we currently transfer about $1.2 million. Um, this would increase it to 1.7 million out of capital into m to support this. Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, benefits, the health um, insurance, I mentioned how that was going up. Um, our certified staff, this is um, the increase and decrease, um, does not have the 1.3%, but just to staffing. We do have a reduction of staffing. Embedded in this is we are moving 12 teachers into the ESSER funds for our iSchool um, to be staffed because based on formula, we would have also got rid of those. So keep those teachers around, move them into iSchool to help provide a better, more robust iSchool environment. Classified, this is a reduction of 10 of the um, um, paraprofessionals um, to help support the program because if we increase the amount everybody's getting, right now they're vacant positions, we can't fill them, let's get rid of, get them off our books and let's use that to increase the funding for our special ed program, our ESS program. There's no additional admin increases. Um, the other changes were all those m and uh, uh, MOU changes and all the other uh, special ed changes that are just talked about. Um, I'd like to set aside a little bit of money for a Prop 206. So even though um, that happens in January and it's not a full year's amount, um, we're given a 1.3% increase. I don't know what the increase is gonna be in January, but if it's 2%, we'll need additional funds because our uh, grade A through D right now are all the same at $12.15. And so if that goes up to 1240, that's greater than a 1.3% increase and I need some funds to cover that. So I just do an estimate. It's just all pure guessing, but I'd rather set aside some money than spend all money and not be prepared for it. Um, the estimated cost of a 1.3% increase is the $2 million. So you have the uh, almost $3 million um, with the transfer um, and we have the 3 million 30. So it leaves us about $111,000 cushion um, in our recommendation. From the capital side, um, so one of the things we also talked about as a group is um, I get a little nervous when we keep just going over to capital and moving money to m and because that, those are permanent moves. And so we talked about as a group in, um, in the IBA team to can we put a cap on the amount we transfer? So this shouldn't be uh, a forever. And so we looked at the max transfer would be a 20% of our capital allocation, that DAA allocation, which means that at no point should we, for the next year's calculation would be $2.3 million. So going up to the 1.7 is still under um, the 80%. And then if you just to, um, so you could also see here how much we're projecting to give the school allocation. It is based on student count, so that gets adjusted. And then department allocations. The department allocations is all requests going in that have been vetted and filtered and all of it coming out of capital. We do believe some of these technology will be moved over to our ESSER funds and some of the federal funds related to COVID. So that'll free up. So this is almost, I don't wanna say worst case scenario, but um, worst on a financial that we could still uh, fund um, all the requests going forward and the transfer going over to m and um, There are uh, just a few considerations that uh, we talked about and the, just uh, the classroom site fund, it went up a lot. Uh, so uh, over $8 million was going into it. So that, that is part of going up $1,500 is a lot uh, for it to go up. We talked about uh, some other districts have uh, looked at providing one-time classroom site funding and then leaving their amounts the same, but a teacher, that's just two different sources on a pay stub that they still see. So you're still giving the full and then taking away. That could happen to us next year as this goes down. Uh, we are projecting, uh, so almost $200 of the $733 per pupil is one time in nature. We did our projections to think that we probably could keep it at 10,500 for two years if it doesn't drop by more than 150. So we, we did some modeling to say, hey, what if it drops but not fully? Um, that we still have some balances in there that will continue. This money has to stay in those funds. We can't transfer it out and use it somewhere else. So I just wanted to uh, convey that we were looking forward because one of our standards is sustainable. Prop 208 funding um, is gonna come into next year's IBA process. And so it, we will not see the money next year, but there will be um, discussion about that with 
Um, I know that's at the Arizona Supreme Court right now, and so we don't know exactly where that lands. Um, but there will be some funding. I, I know that there's also some legislation out there to create an alternative tax for small businesses that would avoid an individual income tax that would then reduce the revenues that this generates. Uh, we also have current legislation, so they're still not done with the legislative session. You heard us at the, at the summer school presentation talk about there is plans for a learning loss bill uh, with the state um, to provide some additional funding uh, for school districts for summer school or learning loss. Um, we think something's going to happen. If I look at the April JLBC monthly budget update, which I read yesterday, um, has a projection based on all uh, everything that's currently in statute and all funding commitments and all revenue projections shows that at the end of fiscal year 2024, the state will have a cash surplus of $6.1 billion. They only spend $12 billion, so they would have 50% cash surplus of an annual budget. Um, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that they're, gonna, they're working on a tax cut right now. Um, I don't know how many billion that is going to be. Um, they uh, don't want to give more to schools because of Prop 208, so I don't think we're going to see a lot on that side. We are asking them right now, which will affect this current year, which is to restore the cuts to the distance learning loss. Um, so we're at around $2 million that they cut us this year for learning loss. Um, we're asking that that be fully restored. Um, I've asked for a lot of different things. I don't think anything will happen, so I'm not going to share all the wish list of things that I email our legislators about. But it is still something to consider. If something happens that, um, is, that we need to alter this, we would come back and, with a recommendation to amend this or something that's additional, we would come back and ask the board if there's any legislation that changes uh, um, to change it going forward. We would communicate that to the board as well. I'll stand for any questions, comments. All right, I'll go first. Um, and this, I, I know I've been pretty vocal about it. So just, and I understand that I'm, I don't have a seat at the table and I'm just one board member. But um, I do struggle with our special ed teachers. Um, just thinking for what they do as far as writing the IEPs and having before school meetings, after school meetings, all the uh, special behaviors and things that they have to endure in their work day. I just really feel strongly, I, I, I'd like to see them um, receive something more than what we're offering as far as it, it looks like, I know you're saying $1,500, um, but really it comes down to about 500 because they're gonna, they're gonna keep that extra 500 rather than drop down to 1,000, I understand that. But then looking at, I'm not saying that any particular group is worth more than another um, at all when I go through these, but just based on your presentation, as far as addendas go, I, you know, I'm seeing an addenda for $4,000 for DSB and the and CTSO sponsor addenda, $3,000, OTPT SLP, $3,000. Um, you know, especially too, when we look at how we asked our voters for the override to pass it to help us recruit and retain highly qualified staff, you know, is all we can give our special education teachers $500? I just think they do an awful lot. And, I, and, and knowing that we're, at, we're, we're giving a lot more money to a lot of different areas, I just, um, personally, I just, I wish that were higher. Again, I know I'm not part of those conversations, um, but those were my initial thoughts when I see that. I just think they, uh, $500 just really isn't a lot of extra for them, in my opinion. Uh -huh. Madam President, members of the board, um, I think everybody works very hard. I think everybody is, uh, they do an amazing job. Uh, we did work with our ESS director and also looked at the data. What is the, where is the place that we could have the most impact? And the paraprofessionals with the vacancies and the turnover is where we could have the most impact. And so we wanted to solve that problem. The second biggest when we talked to them was our OTs, PTs, and the outsourcing and the problems that that has and the vacancies that that has. And so this also tries to address that. So uh, it may not provide more than the $500 extra to a special ed teacher. We are working to, um, and, and we could, this isn't something that's one and done. 
Uh, we'll continue to look at it and look at the data, but we try to be as efficient and effective as possible with our dollars and where can we have the biggest impact to improve and, imp and support programs the best possible. And we do believe this does satisfy that. And for clarity, and that's why I said it earlier, but just to your point since you mentioned it, I am not saying that one group is any more important than another. I, of course, I understand that everyone is important and worth more. So I, I want to clarify that because yeah. you mentioned it. <laughs> the, uh, Madam President, members of the board, I was not alluding to that. I will say, um, also talking to, uh, is it Dr. Montagna? There's a lot of doctors now. Um, our ESS director, um, she is looking for other ways. I know we piloted a program to provide a Monday um, uh, using your prep day to help on IEPs and we're looking at our caseloads right now are very high. So the question is, can we do something to start reducing our caseloads um, and the burden that's also on the teachers in some of those. And so that is also looking at how can we do the case management so they maybe don't have as many IEPs and, and that too. So providing them a little bit more time and break in that time too. Uh, Mr. Hicks and uh probably uh, Dr. Croto may want to chime in on this. Um, as far as our addendas with um, the different areas, are they in comparison with our neighboring districts that are about this size? Um, Madam President, members, think, what, are you talking to OTPT? Uh, um, well, SOP I know OTPT is, is um, I'm not even talking about that. There are some districts that are larger that don't have to contract out yeah. for them, those type things. Um, but I'm talking about like for the um, uh, the ESS, hard to fill. Um, do we, are there any lead nurse addendas that are out there in other districts? Um, for individual addendums, addendas, uh, Yes, uh, most do some type of lead to, instead of hiring a position that you'll have one that's just managing them, you'll just provide a stipend addenda to one to kind of coordinate and be the. Right, but how are they as far as compared to other school districts? So, um, I only know a couple districts offhand, so I don't know if that's a good comparison to all. Um, and 3000 is right in the ballpark of all those, but I don't know, I don't have a wealth of knowledge of a, a lot of districts that attend those. Madam President and Member Sawyer Shinkville, um, Ken is correct that they're in line and we know the CTSO one um, is definitely in line uh, because that is what the other districts do. So that's why they're trying to go from the 2042 to the 3000 to be um, like our neighboring districts and be equal with them. Um, cause I, and just to piggyback on what Ms. Pritchard says, um, there are some school districts that do pay 2000 to $2,500 for a hard to fill. Yeah. And um, I, I do agree with her with regards to uh, the time that is spent creating an IEP and sitting through meetings and stuff. Um, I, I know everyone in our district works extremely hard, um, but sometimes those positions are very hard to fill with qualified people. So. Um, but yeah, there are some that pay 2000 2500 um, It's just difficult all the way around. And it would be great if we had OT and PT on staff that we didn't have to pay those extra, extra dollars um, uh, to provide those services for our students. Um, and, and Madam President, Member Sawyer Singville, um, currently we have 24 ESS uh, SLP and OT vacant positions that we contract for. Let's see, this 24. Oh, 24. And the dollar amount we pay for contract it is much higher. It's much higher. It's much higher. Okay. Just a quick question on slide three. Um, the keywords that are used there, the legal, affordable, alignment, sustainable, viable, was that, um, are you saying that that was, that those terms were board adopted? It is in policy, Madam President, okay. members of the board. Gotcha. I thought that was like something new that we had a meeting on and agreed to and I'm spacing <laughs> out. <laughs> um, Madam President, members of the board, okay. I think uh, Dr. Dean could give us the history lesson of when they were because he mentioned. Uh, Each year we've. 
We, we re-adopt the same yes, thing every year. The same okay. thing each year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank I don't you. think anything was specifically brought to the board to say please adopt yeah. <laughs> something. It was just in our policy of okay. our meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I just I want a clarification. I th if I'm reading this correctly, on the high school theater, high school theater agenda, it's 2,042 per semester per high school. Yeah. Correct. And what was it before? Uh, Madam President, Member Grant, it was 2042 for both semesters. So they needed to do uh, two shows total. Now we're saying they need to do four to each semester and they will receive 2042 each semester. Hold that thought. <laughs> Hold that thought. I think it's one of the things. Now I'm, I'm just going back over. Another dispatcher. Answered that, and um, the combined total was okay. And currently, how many uh, teachers do we have uh, that are certified in dual enrollment? Do we remember how many we have? Um, Madam President, members of the board, I do not have how many teachers are certified nor do I know the exact number. I looked at to model uh, this, um, these rates I took and created a bunch of different scenarios based on the number of uh, students we had and the number of different classes because it, depending on where it breaks, you could be paying two teachers, might only have five in each class and so you'd have to pay the full amount instead of just paying one and so with the benefits associated, I grabbed a bunch of modeling to show uh, what's a worst case scenario, best case scenario, but depending on how it all floats out. And so then I created this um, amounts based on that to make sure that we're not exceeding 45. At no point did it go above 42%, uh, percent, but there could be some other scenarios that have a stipend or two increase. So that's why I used that. Okay. And I'll Madam President, that. Member Sawyer Sink Bill, we, we have numbers that range from um, 24 on some campuses to um, uh, you know, a dozen or so on others. A few years back, uh, if you'll recall, the state changed the, the rules for those um, who are able to, t to teach dual enrollment courses, um, mm -hmm. and so that lowered the number that are available. Our, um, our principals have worked very hard to hire more staff that are eligible to do so. Okay. All right. Thank you. Madam President, members of the board, just uh, I know I didn't couch it this way in the presentation, but just looking at the 500 hard to fill, the 3% retention stipend, the 1.3% and the 1500 classroom site fund, our average special ed teacher that makes $58,000 would get 42.54, which is a 7.3% raise for next year, which is only the $500 more than the others to, to your point, but. 42.54? 42.54. And our classified staff, if they're not a paraprofessional, would be getting 1.3%, and our admin staff would be getting 1.3%. Okay. I left out of there the, some of the non-classroom site fund certified staff, but there's lots of different categories, but I was just trying to provide some context for the board. I don't have any okay. other questions.
Mm -mm. Thank you very much, Mr. Hicks. Thank you very much. Educational leadership from Grand Canyon University and a master's degree in arts from Spalding University. Uh, she has extensive educational experience, currently a teacher at Dysart Elementary School and has two years of administrative experience um, outside of our district. So with that, I will stand for any questions and vote and then I'll wait for the vote and we can welcome her and her. She has her family with her here tonight too. So. Just curious, uh, Miss V, um, did I read this correctly that you uh, had taught at Field Elementary? At Field Elementary? Yes. I actually taught English here. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you very much. I thought it was a field that was out here. Um, impressive resume. Um, you're, you're one of those, um, I like to call uh, a professional student that you keep on uh, absorbing and keep on studying and everything. So very impressive. Thank you. Um, I move the appointment of Mrs. V. Because <laughs> I don't want to slaughter her name mm -hmm. as the elementary school assistant principal. Second. <coughs> Motion passes. Congratulations. Welcome. <laughs> Happy dance. <laughs> Next we have item H2, Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, members of cabinet, Mr. Croto, Dr. Croto will also introduce this item. Thank you, Dr. Kellis, Madam President, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Kellis, cabinet guests. Uh, our second recommendation this evening is for the Director of Research and Achievement position. Uh, we are proud to recommend uh, Ms. Amy Hartchin um, as the uh, candidate for this position. As you know, uh, Ms. Hartchin has been with the district 21 years and eight years as principal at Dysart High School. Um, with that, Ms. Hartchin has a master's degree in curriculum instruction from Arizona State University, uh, has extensive educational experience, and like I said, as well as 21 years in our district, and we are very happy to recommend her for this position, and she is also here this evening. Ms. Harchin, do you realize that you have to um, eat and regurgitate a whole bunch of numbers at any given time? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve the appointment of Amy Hartgen as Director of Research and Achievement. Second. Second. Seconded by Christine Pritchard. Go ahead. I think she beat you. Motion passes. Thank you. 
Congratulations to uh, to both of you this evening. Both of you. Welcome. Congrats. Uh, okay, next we have item H3, Dr. Kellis. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board and members of cabinet. Um, it has been uh, the routine over the last several board meetings to bring forward to the board an opportunity for conversation regarding COVID matters um, this evening. Uh, this also will continue. Um, I believe we have some public comments that we will begin this item with. And I'll go ahead and reread the statement. This is a time for the public to comment. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Pursuant to ARS 38-431.03H, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism or scheduling the matter for future consideration and decision at a later date. In order to facilitate accomplishing the business of the district in a timely manner, a time limit of three minutes will be imposed for each individual or group addressing the board. When you approach the podium, please state your name for the record. And tonight, the first person requesting to speak is Tina Malika. My name is Tina Malika. I am a parent of two children here in Dysart School District. Good evening, Dr. Kellis, cabinet members, and governing board members. I have come to discuss the COVID protocol and mitigation plan. Our family chose iSchool for the first three quarters of the 2021 school year in order to keep ourselves and our community safe. It has been difficult and stressful, and we've made many sacrifices to make it work believing that the safety and health of our community was the priority. Fourth quarter, we decided to return our elementary student to in-person learning, knowing that the numbers were improving, many Arizonans were receiving the vaccine, and mitigation measures such as masks were in place at Dysart. Our high schooler continues to remain in a combination of high school and in-person learning. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the NEA, AEA, both Arizona and Maricopa County Health Departments, as well as State Superintendent Kathy Hoffman, have all recommended that school leaders and board members continue to implement universal mask wearing as recommended by the CDC. The CDC has also recommended this mask wearing. Although I, appreciate, I do appreciate the efforts that Dysart has made to keep the schools clean and safe during the pandemic, but the science tells us that COVID-19 is airborne and cleaning surfaces alone will not prevent it from spreading. Unlike this room here, physical distancing is also impossible in a small classroom with 25 plus kids. If you remove the mask mandate, there will be nothing left to protect our students for these last three weeks of school, especially those of us who have not been vaccinated. It has been less than a month since those 16 and over can receive, a second, or can receive the vaccine. My husband and I are due to receive that vaccine next week. It is scientifically proven, despite what you may hear, that children can spread the virus. We are currently at a 10% positivity rate, 40% of Arizonans are vaccinated. There simply has not been enough time for all of us to get vaccinated yet. For over a year, we have done our best to bring this virus to an end. It has been difficult and exhausting for the district, the community, the teachers, and its families. We are so close. Do we really want to risk the health of families not yet vaccinated? and send more students home to quarantine with just three weeks left in the school year. I am asking that you vote to leave the mask mandate in place for these last 15 days. 15 days to allow people to get more of the vaccine, 15 days for students to complete their school year in person and for seniors to graduate. 15 days until summer break where we will have another two months to let the virus continue to decline. I hope that you will each consider the science as well as the safety of all Dysart families carefully when making this decision. I know this has been a hard year for everyone. I thank you for your time. Thank you. I do want to apologize in advance for any mispronunciations um, of anyone's name. So I apologize for that. Okay. <laughs> okay, the next person we have is Lisa Moberg.
Good evening. My name is Lisa Moberg, and I am a sixth grade teacher with the Desert Unified School District. I've been a loyal employee of this district for 17 years. I'm also a mother of two boys who are both products of the Desert Schools, my youngest graduating in three weeks from tonight. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I sent you earlier an email with all the medical and scientific facts of wearing masks as of today um, without the biased decisions or thoughts of politics. We are currently living and working through a global pandemic, and we need to remember to stay focused on the health and safety of our children. As a veteran teacher, I can attest to the power of consistency. If we have required our staff, parents, and students to wear masks all school year, let's remain consistent with a safety measure which has lowered our COVID cases in the city of Surprise and in our district. If we take away the power of consistency, this will increase anxiety as students and staff during the most stressful time of the year. As a mother, I'm begging that we keep our schools safe while my son completes his last three weeks of his Dysart school career. He started at the Dysart preschool at three years old with Miss Yolanda, and he's been a happy and secure child while growing up with the Dysart schools. Currently, he is so stressed and anxious about COVID that he didn't even attend prom. And the fact that his peers might show up without masks in the next few days is also causing a lot of anxiety. Our seniors are really stressed out with, right now with college admissions, finals, and graduation. Let's keep them safe and secure so they aren't quarantined for graduation. As a staff member, I'm asking you to keep our loyal and brave teachers and staff safe for the last three weeks of the longest school year I've taught in 24 years. We have a volunteer with a heart condition who comes to school every day to help the school nurse. Let's keep her safe. We have a staff member who just survived her battle with breast cancer and is back with us. Let's keep her safe. We have a teacher whose husband is battling stage four cancer. Let's keep him safe. Masks prevent all people from getting COVID-19. Let's continue our safety measures which provide people, especially the children, with a sense of security. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we're going to take a brief recess.